Hey guys, this is Bruce. Welcome to Combo Courses Podcast. And today we're going to break down the NIST CSF. If you didn't know, right now, for the next few days, I have a free um, book for the NIST CSF book. I do this from time to time. If you've been following me, you know that um, every now and then I'll have free stuff, free audio books, free um, downloadables. And uh, it's just to promote the book in the beginning if you're wondering why I'm giving away free stuff. Um, it did take me a little bit of effort to do. <laughs> so um, I do this so I can get some some um, some reviews. So if you don't mind, if you do get the book uh, at a discount, if you're watching this later, it might be still at a discount, hopefully for you. Um, but regardless, if you get onto this book, link in description, link in bio, um, go ahead and leave me a review. Happy Veterans Day. I'm a veteran. It's a great way to support a veteran if you're if you want to. So. On that note, what we're going to do is break down this book. So, you know, if you want to buy it or if you don't want to, I'll get and give you some free other resources that you can use to understand this better if you uh, have to get into this. So who is this for, first of all? So this is for IT professionals who want to know a little bit more about cybersecurity and getting into GRC type stuff. This is for people. This, this, this CSF is an incredible introduction to, to GRC stuff. GRC is governance, risk, and compliance. Um, it gives you a really good um, understanding, a well-rounded understanding of cybersecurity from a bird's eye view and specifically GRC and this kind of stuff I talk about on a, on a regular basis. Um, and you'll understand why it's so effective for organizations. So it's for IT professionals who want to know more about GRC, more about cybersecurity, uh, this is for policy people who have to do this kind of stuff every day. And maybe you you are working in an organization and you need some type of framework to help your organization be compliant with certain federal laws. And you'll see in this breakdown how NIST CSF can actually help you to um, be compliant with those federal laws. So first of all, what is NIST CSF? So the NIST CSF is a standard that came about um, in the early 2000s. There was a spike in, in the amount of threats, the spike in the amount of exploits that were happening. And so the U.S. government decided that they needed something to help other organizations to be more secure. Because in the in the beginning, before 2000, a lot of the attacks were for hard targets, were for prime targets like military places with like secrets or really sensitive information and things like that. So what happened in uh, early 2000s, right into 2006, you'll see a trend go up, especially right when you get into 2008, 2009, 2010. There's this huge spike in the number of, uh, of threats that start taking place. And the reason why is because more stuff started going online, for one thing. And another thing is governments started to weaponize cyber. Governments started to fund, not that they weren't doing this before, but they really ramped it up. So China, U.S., Russia, all the main players, pretty much any government uh, who had a reason to do it started funding different um, weaponization of cyberspace. Like they would, whether they were funding a whole branch of, of elite hackers or they had, they were creating malware, stuff like that. And they started attacking uh, different countries to pull information or whatever, whatever reason they're doing it for. All the attacks just went up and they started doing it against soft targets, meaning they started going after hospitals. They start going after pipelines. They start going after energy sector. They start going after everything. And so that's why right now it's just a free for all right now. And so the government, the president at the time, I believe it was Obama, came out with an executive order saying, OK, we need to come together and figure out something that's going to help the critical infrastructure. So that administration came together. And, and this is not something that's unique. Every organization, every um, every administration is is hit with some kind of huge technical revolution where they have to respond. And so their cabinet, their staff comes together with a bunch of professionals in the field to say, look, we need to handle AI. We need to handle these new cybersecurity threats. We need to handle whatever, right? 
So in during the Obama administration, this this threat just ramped ramped up. Cyber threats ramped up. So they came out with a whole bunch of initiatives, and one of them, uh, one of those executive orders in, inspired the launch of NIST CSF, the, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. And I want to show you my screen right now to show you what it looks like and walk, kind of give you um, a bird's eye view of the book and to give you an idea of what it is. So what I want to do is give you an understanding of what what this is to see if if this is something that you want to go deeper into or if nothing else, learn a little something about what this is. So here's the book right here. This is a two in one book that you're going to get if you actually go. On the site, it's a two-in-one book. It's if you've been watching me for a while, you'll have seen me launch the these two books are out there right now. You can get them individually, but this book is both books in one. And it's got a bunch of great downloadables that you can actually use for your organization. But let's get into what this is all about. All right. So the first book is a breakdown of what the NIST cybersecurity framework is. And I start off the chapter by saying one framework to rule them all, because that's kind of what this framework is. The first chapter, what I do is break down like why? Why did they come up with this? What was the executive order that kicked all of this off? Now, for you, it's probably not important to understand exactly or know exactly what that uh, executive order is. But you just need to know that the why the why is that there was a bunch of um, there was a bunch of new attacks that started happening. So the executive order from the president came down and said, OK, we need to do something about people hitting our soft targets. And they came up with the NIST cybersecurity framework that was based off of this executive order. So if you happen to be in the policy and stuff, sometimes this comes up and it is important for you to know or for you to reference or something like that. And this executive order 13636 that came that uh, kicked off the cybersecurity framework. Not super important for what we're talking about. <laughs> so let's just get into this. So um, the NIST CSF is not mandatory. So meaning you don't have to do this. It's something that that is, uh, is a guide to help an organization to be compliant with, cyber, with best practice, security best practices and line you up with the current laws that are in place. And I want to give you a really good demonstration of why, of how this all works from a bird's eye view so you can kind of get an idea. Let me see if I can find there's a really good breakdown of this. And if you look in link in description, it'll have some downloadables that you can go to that I'm about to show you. But it looks like this. This will make a little bit more sense in a second. This is the NIST CSF in a nutshell. And this is why, why it's so uh, powerful. Right. So NIST CSF breaks it up by functions. Break. So every organization has certain functions that they need to do for cybersecurity. What I mean by functions is you're going to have to see the blue area there. You're going to have to identify all of your systems, your assets, your business, uh, your mission, um, all of your resources that you have. You're going to have to Another function that every organization needs to do is protect those uh, those assets that they identify. And you're going to have to another business function that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to detect. That means detect anomalies, detect strange stuff that's going on on your network, detect new systems and new stuff that pops up on your network. Um, you need to also have the functionality to in your organization to respond. That means if you have um, some kind of cybersecurity threats that pop up or some kind of virus that pops up, you're going to have to be able to do that uh, in your organization. You're also going to have to be able to recover. Let's say you you got hit with a ransomware. You can't open certain files. You have uh, you have an, you have antivirus that is Trojan that's going through worms, is going through your whole network. You're going to have to be able to recover from that attack. So those are the functions, the main business functions that every organization has to do. Now, think about it. Every organization, this is something that everyone needs to do no matter what, no matter what organization, no matter what industry you're in, you're going to have to do these things. You're going to have to identify what's going on in your network. What do we have on our network? What is our main business function? What is our mission? 
What is our what do we do? Like that's identification. It's identifying what you actually do, what kinds of threats are out there, what kinds of assets do we have on our network? The identity function, that's what you're doing. You're identifying everything. You're taking inventory of everything that you have to that you need in your organization and you're breaking it all down, right? That's the first thing you do. And it the NIST CSF goes through great detail to break down um, each one of the categories of this, which I'll show you in, in here in a second. But you have to identify everything in your organization, identify the threats, identify the risk. Those are the things you're identifying. Then you're going to protect, protect all the things that your major assets, all the things that make you have a business, all those things you have to figure out how we're going to protect those. And it's not just a firewall. You know, you have things like uh, data protection where you have to learn, have encryption on your uh, on your network. You have to have things like separation of networks, maybe. So it depends on what kind of data you have, but the protection is a function that every organization, every business has to have. Whether you're a small mom and pop that's selling video games or um, um, international telecommunication uh, network. So it doesn't matter. You ha Everybody has to do these main functions. So the CSF focuses on that. Now, the big difference between a NIST CSF and the NIST 800, the NIST 800 is an industrial strength GRC. It's industrial strength governance, risk, and compliance. It lines itself up with um, engineering, um, software and system engineering practices, and it can take upwards of, of eight months to a year to do. Like it's for federal organizations that are doing uh, sen very sensitive information or very large systems, um, but every federal organization has to follow the NIST CSF. It's taken very, very seriously. But it's it doesn't really the problem with the NIST 800 is it doesn't fit every situation because it's just too big. I mean, you can use it like you a mom and pop can use the NIST 800, but it's just not it's not going to be worth their money to do it because it's going to take a lot of time. If you have to have a full time guy to just manage that. And sometimes you don't have a full, you have a full-time dude doing IT, but that's to like maintain your, your network, to maintain your systems and things like that. You're not going to have a, a, a dude just doing uh, all the documentation and stuff that you need for NIST 800. So the difference is that NIST CSF, the NIST CSF is for anybody, but the NIST 800 is mainly, it's created specifically for the government and you've got a lot of frameworks that are like that, like the the financial sector has their own frameworks and own uh, security that they have to do. The healthcare sector, you name it, all these different sectors have their own one. But the NIST CSF, what's unique about it is it can flow across any different platform. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. So check this out. So if you go here. If you go to, let me see, let me see if I can switch this thing. Bear with me. I'm, I'm trying to do this on, on TikTok. I don't even know if it's worth doing it on TikTok, to be honest with you. I don't have the right tools. I don't know if I have enough. It don't allow me to. <laughs> so anyway. All right. So now check this out. So here we are back on the NIST CSF form here. And this is kind of what I'm breaking down in the book. The book goes into greater detail about what it has a whole storyline of how all of this works. It's really explaining this um, at a at a at your own pace. Like you can go through the book on your own pace. Book is free right now, but um, not going to be free for long. Anyway, so check this out. So in our first functionality, we had, we identify assets, right? And in this case, in this first category, we're going to uh, identify all the asset management. That means like we have to make sure that we know where all of our data is, what kind of data we have, where are our physical systems, where our soft, how much software do we have, things like that. Where's our software? And you normally have a what's called a software inventory to do that. So check this out. So for software inventory, this lines up with several different frameworks. So if you if you know NIST CSF, this is why NIST CSF is so powerful. Because if you know CSF, it lines up with all the other frameworks. This is the CIS controls. This is used by retail. This is used all over the world. It's a very, uh, very popular framework, but it also lines up with COBIT. It lines up with international standards such as ISO, 
ISO 27001. Um, and it lines up with um, the NIST 853. So if you know this, you'll, you'll have a very good understanding what every organization needs to do. Every organization needs to have a physical inventory of all their devices. Every organization needs to have a, an inventory, like a list of all their software that in all applications that are and track them on a regular basis. And that lines it up across all other platforms. Every organization needs to have um, organizational data flow maps. That's like network maps and things like that. They need to know what their infrastructure looks like, where the data is going in and out, interconnections, all that kind of stuff. Um, they need to have uh, cybersecurity goal, roles and responsibilities. They need to have, it just goes down the list of everything you need. And these are all the subcategories. So the book explains each one in painstaking detail of each one of these subcategories and then goes further and maps these maps out all of this. In fact, mine's updated. It's, it's more updated than what's on the actual, um, uh, it's on the site. So that's a lot of work went into this, especially on the downloadables. So there's some downloadables that you can get to that helps you to, that comes with the book, by the way. So that's what the book talks about. And then what I do is I go a little bit further and I tell you, if you are trying to use this in your organization, I tell you how you can actually use it. Like if you were to create a policy that was based on the NIST CSF, I give you a template that says, OK, here's a template, a downloadable template that you can actually use and start and start uh, use it in your organization. Of course, you need to change everything, put put your relevant data in there and all that kind of stuff. But that's what this book is walking you through. This is obviously it's not for everybody. Because not not everybody is in this uh, IT. Maybe you're on the fringes of it. Maybe you're a project manager. You don't really need to know this for your particular job. This is not for everybody. But for those of you who are IT professionals who want to know more about GRC, if you happen to be a cybersecurity person who's trying to get into GRC, man, this right here, if you understand this, if you have an understanding of what we're talking about here, you can actually... Um, that will help you in your career because you can map NIST CSF across NIST 800, across ISO 27001, across every organization that I've been to in the last five years, they reference NIST CSF in some way, shape or form. It just comes up because it's just really great to use to map across different frameworks. So that's the NIST CSF in a nutshell. Uh, it goes into greater detail in the book about uh, how how profiles are used in there briefly talks about that talks about the tiers um, which is an incredible part of the NIST CSF because what it does is it says look you have implementation tiers some people some organizations might be partial they might have a partial implementation of some of the security features but they're identifying that they're saying look we can't implement everything but we can implement some things so we are a tier level one all the way to tier level four, where you're not only have you implemented everything that you can and you tailored the controls, but also you're looking for ways to constantly improve things like your, your training uh, regimen, how you're doing cybersecurity awareness training. You're always improving it and you're tracking all of that. You're monitoring everything. So there's different levels of effort that you would use for the NIST CSF. And that's why it's so incredible. It really can fit any kind of level of organization, any kind of size of organization, it's it's really a great uh, framework for you to put on your resume if you understand it. Um, let me see. Let me. I've got some questions here. Uh, starting off with um, LinkedIn, somebody said, "How close is it to other frameworks like the GSIG?" So the great thing about about the NIST CSF is it is it is an open enough framework to where you can you can include just about any law, act, regulation, or framework. And the reason why is because let me just kind of switch screens here is because of this. The way it's structured is it's based off of functions that you every organization needs to have, and those functions are identification of your assets, identification of your business mission function. Um, protection of the data and those business essential functions, 
It's detection of any kind of anomalies that come in. Um, it's um, response. How does the organization respond if you do get attacked? And then recovery. Once you get attacked, how do you, how did you get rid of that thing? Every function needs to have those things. Every every single organization needs to have those functions. And so this NIST CSF makes it so that you could actually integrate a G-SIG. You can integrate um, a homegrown proprietary security uh, pr program. You can integrate uh, a PCI compliance, a HIPAA compliance. All those things can be integrated. And that's why so many organizations use it, because you can line everything up so that it's just a really awesome um awesome way to track all those things together you can even have i've seen organization have a big matrix where they have their own homegrown security controls and then they line those up with their with the nist 800 and then they line all that up with the nist csf so it's extremely flexible it can it can line up with G, jsig or whatever i don't even know what jsig is but whatever it is if it has let me tell you like this if it has if if you're uh, if JSIG, and I think that's an Intel, is it's Intel based, isn't it? I, I'm not sure. But if it's if it has best security practices, then it can line up with the the NIST CSF. Happy holidays, happy Veterans Day, guys. Okay, let me see if I have any other folks. Just open topics, guys. Anybody have any questions or or anything? Let me see. Um, okay. Um, let me see if I have some legit stuff here. Happy Veterans Day, Bruce. I got the book. We'll definitely work through it. CSF is certainly the best general framework to learn. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. It's, it is the best, uh, general framework to learn if you're trying to get in GS and if you're trying to get in GRC, it's really, really good to learn for GRC. For a start, I might even do a whole course where I just walk you through NIST CSF and and then explain what I can explain all of GRC with just NIST CSF. It's that powerful. It's that amazing. Um, best somebody said the best way to start cybersecurity, uh, and I I don't know if that's a, a statement, but NIST NIST CSF is a great way to start, especially if you're trying to go the GRC route. It's a good document to just pick up and learn. How do I get the book? Book is in link is in description to go straight to the book. Right now it's free on Kindle for a limited time. I think after uh, Monday it's going to go full price. But I think what I'll do is is have it still um, limited price, um, a discounted price for a while, just to kind of get some. The reason why I do this is promotional. Like I need to get the word out for the book. So the best way to do that is to kind of discount it for a while so I can get some reviews. So if you guys don't mind, I'm a veteran. If you want to support a veteran, a poor veteran like myself or get a veteran some uh, some kudos, then leave me a, a response on that book, uh, some stars on that book. And that really helps me out with the Amazon algorithm. So I appreciate that. Uh, let me see. How do I get the book? OK, I already answered that one. Free for a limited time, guys. You know, I do this from time to time. Could you please share with me the link? The link is in my profile. So go to my profile, the button up here. If you happen to be on TikTok, click that. You'll see a link. It's combocourses.net. The very first link, that'll be the book. They'll take you directly to the book. It's free on Kindle right now. Uh, so you can check it out. You're doing awesome work. Hey, thanks, Anthony. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. I'm um, just trying to share the share the wealth because, um, you know, my life has been pretty blessed uh, in this career field. I talk about it a lot, um, seeing the praises of cybersecurity. It's just it's just been really good to me and my family. It's uh, it's just been really great to uh, work for decent companies that will um, that uh, are also trying to protect um, all manners of, uh, of of sensitive information, you know, from the government information to healthcare information to financial sector. I've worked in all these different industries, and it's used NIST CSF, NIST 800, all kinds of different standards. But NIST CSF is a really great way, really good introduction to uh, GRC. A lot of people come on here, ask me about how to get into GRC. What do I do? 
This 800 is, where I, is sometimes what I'll reference if they're talking about government, um, if they're talking about retail, PCI compliance. But overall, across every industry, whether you're in the government, the military, industrial complex, the pharmacy, pharmaceutical, if you happen to be in the healthcare industry, if whatever industry you happen to be working in, um, the NIST CSF lines up with it because if it has a best security practice, it can line up with the functions that every organization is supposed to have. The way that they put it together is actually brilliant because it fits in every, it fits in every different, um, in really every single situation because every every single organization has to have those core functions which is to identify what you have is to protect what you have once you've identified it uh and to respond be able to respond uh, do incident response and things like that and then to recover if you get hit but also to detect to have an organ to have something to where you can constantly detect what's going on in you and that's called continuous monitoring so so every organization has to have those and, and those categories break into subcategories to tell you how to do that, how every organization can do that. Now, this first book is NIST CSF version 1.0. Uh, they're working on a, a version 2.0 right now, but it's not out yet. I don't think it comes out till 20, 2024. So 20, I think it's going to supersede 20, uh, version 1. But for now, 1 is the one that everybody's using. So. And from what I understand, too, just having glanced at it, version two is going to include governance. It's going to have governance as its own subcategory, but there might be some other changes to it. But I've got to review it. They're not done with the finalization of the book yet. So I, I, once they finalize, once the government has finalized what they want to do with the NIST CSF version two, I'll, re, I'll do maybe do another book that breaks that one down, too. But I'm, I'm not sure yet about that one. Somebody said, are you from Chicago? No, actually, I'm from originally from Sacramento, California. Right now, I'm in um, I'm in uh, Colorado. been living here. This this is a place I call home now. Um, open topics, guys. Open topics. Happy Veterans Day. Appreciate everybody. Thank you for joining this live. Uh, much appreciated. Much appreciated and right on time. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for that question. So, yeah, NIST CSF um, is where I've been focused on in the last um, few months. Um, and I put out two books and only recently collapsed those into a bundle. The next thing I'm going to do is uh, is put those bundles into an audiobook, And I'll have a free link. If you, ha if you happen to follow my newsletter, um, I'm going to be releasing that for free. I they give me – what happens is Amazon – uh, gives you some free link, the uh, free codes to allow your your followers to have a free version of the book. But I guess what I can do in my newsletter here real soon is release, and I've done this before, is ask anybody if they want a free version of the audio books for the uh, for those old two books that because those books are already out on audio, the ones that I've combined together. Um, they're separate, but. Um, I think what I'll do is release free audiobook for the NIST CSF. If anybody's interested, I'll I'll be putting that link out on the on the newsletter. If for those of you who don't know, like on my newsletter, I'm constantly giving out free stuff, man. Free, free downloadables, constantly jobs that I can't use. I already have a job. I'm already employed. Um, I'm overemployed, so I don't I don't need any more work. So yeah, any like if you follow me, I'm constantly giving out free stuff. Not all of it's your stuff you're gonna use, but it's nice to have in your back pocket. You know, I'm usually I try to give stuff that I would really want, like the the remote jobs, other things I give out a lot, because I'm like, damn, I I would I would try to go for this remote job if I were you. You know, what I mean, like um, somebody said, uh, what study material do you recommend for the CS uh, the CISSP exam? So. I do have a CISSP, not an easy certification, one of the hardest um, certifications I've ever taken. And uh, what I use was the official CISSP guide. I used the actual uh, website on IC2Square. They have some really good resources, downloadable um, 
downloadable uh, study cards. They have um, a breakdown of the of the sections that are going to be most relevant for you to focus on. And then they have like a percentage of how much each section, each domain they're going to focus on according to the test. So definitely go to IC2 squared. Um, official book, IC2 squared. One of my best resources was there used to be this site called cccure.org. I don't know what they're doing these days. It used to be free. I think yeah, they charge you now. But that site uh, had a, like thousands and thousands of questions, randomized questions. It wasn't like a brain dump or anything like that. I don't recommend like brain dumps because, number one, you can't really learn that way. You really need to learn the material. You know, so you don't want to just go memorize and test. Plus, they can't, some people poison those things, have a bunch of bullshit in them. So avoid those like the plague. You really want to be um, a well-respected uh, professional that's beyond reproach. You want to know your shit is what I'm trying to tell you. So to do that, you got to avoid cheating. And there's a there's something called brain dumps where you can go and it has the answers like people take the test and go out or people who are proctors from other countries will go out and dump this some of the answers on. You really want to know this shit and you want to be um, a business professional beyond reproach. So what you want to do is know this material, know what at all cost, know this material. So anyway, the best places to do what you want to do is, number one, get the official guide read that book. What I did was I took notes on all the most important parts and then I studied my notes. Now I studied for a year. You probably don't need to study for a year. I'm a psycho. So that's just me. You know, I'm just paranoid. So I just kept overstudying. Um, and then I studied my notes. That was probably the most effective thing I did besides the, the q and A. I I just got this huge database of questions, of possible questions that hit every single domain. And I just kept going over and over and over. And then another thing I did was I made my own questions. And then another thing I did, and it just practice those over and over again. And then another thing is in the book, on the in those, in the actual official guide, they have a bunch of questions in the back. I just kept taking the questions over right before the test. I went through the questions until I memorized the answers to the, to every single possible question. So that's what I did. And it worked out. I passed it the first time. But I mean, again, I studied for like a year and had like, I don't know, at that point, six years of experience or whatever. Uh, Nathan, Nathan, you have a CISSP. What what resources did you use? Nathan said, if you had one, if you had to choose one resource uh, for a soon to be ISSO, what's your favorite uh, job resource. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna cover that one in a second, but let me answer the CISSP question. So CISSP question. Um what resource um other resources? Oh, you know what? They have this really cool a couple resources where you have like a uh, it's like a software. There's several of them um that you can get, but it's like a software that it tests you. They had this one called visual explanation. Let me see if it's still out there. And they had a bunch of different certs. And you can, it's software you can download and it'll just randomize. Boson questions is one of them. Yeah, Boson. I didn't have that one. I, I think I used Visual. I don't remember what it was called. But there's these this software that has tests like Boson, B-O-S-O-N questions. And if you get that, It'll have a bunch of randomized questions that are based on the domains of the CSF, uh, the CISSP, and that is a great uh, place to learn. And Nathan said he used, I believe Nathan, you're saying that you use Boson's questions. You need you use Adam Gordon Bootcamp. Adam Gordon Bootcamp. He says he used uh, destination certification, books, and mind maps. Awesome. Thank you for that. I appreciate you. Yeah, but don't be intimidated by it, man. Go for that test. If you have to take it again, take it again. Uh, okay, so let me answer this question from Nathan. Nathan said, if you had one, if you had to choose one resource for a soon-to-be ISSO, an information system security officer, what's your favorite? What's my favorite resource for that job? Um, the best resource. 
for an ISSO is going to be the security policy. So the reason why I say that, and that's the first one, I'm going to, I'm going to give you tiers. The first one is going to be their security policy. And the reason why is because all security of that organization is based, is supposed to be based off of their security policy. Now, if they have a decent security policy, it'll walk you through how, first of all, what framework they're using. Because are they using NIST CSF? Are they using NIST 800? Are you, they using some combination of those? It'll somewhere in their reference what they're actually using. Is it based off of FISMA? If it is, is it a FedRAMP system that's cloud-based? It'll tell you, it's supposed to tell you at from a bird's eye view what kind of what they do with security. And then it'll guide you to what kind of um what kind of procedures and processes that they have throughout the organization. So the very best resource that you're gonna have is going to come directly from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So um, I've worked for different organizations, the DOD, I've worked for different three level organizations or whatever. I've worked for NASA. And one thing that they, what I'll see that's in common among all of these is that if you read the actual, um, if you read the actual security policy, it'll break down what they're trying to do. And the organization is supposed to, uh, stick to that policy. That policy is like gospel and that's what they're supposed to be doing. And nine times out of 10, when they do have assessments, the assessor is going to be looking at the policy, the procedures and all that kind of stuff. Resource number two for somebody who's brand new, who doesn't really know like the frameworks and all that and how that stuff works is going to be the NIST for ISSO for the federal government now. All right. We're talking about a GRC person who works for the federal government. So there's a secret sauce here, and that's called the NIST 837. NIST 837 breaks down the entire NIST 800 risk management framework process. Once you understand how the NIST CSF process works, it'll make sense. It won't matter what government agency you go to because they all are using that. They'll have different names for things like the DOD has something called PIT or Platform Information Technology. They have different names. They have AIS, Automated Information System, which is a fancy word for a uh, server. You know, <laughs> they'll have different names for the same stuff, but all of it is pretty much in line with the NIST, uh, the NIST 837. And then let me see if I can find this, this uh, visual representation of the NIST. 837 to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. You may have seen this diagram before, but it's very, once you start reading this, uh, the NIST um, 837, you'll start to understand this process right here. So that's NIST uh, 837. And then in a nutshell, but here's here's the actual document right here. Now, it's going to be in government ease. <laughs> the way that they word stuff is very academic, unfortunately. It's one of the problems that I had when I first started working in this. It's just a pain in the ass the way they word things. So what I did was I wrote like a short document. Uh, you can find my book out there. It's called, um, it's called um, Risk Management Framework Foundations, and it's specifically for ISOs, for brand new ISOs. And all I do is I'm pulling information directly out of the risk of uh, the NIST 837. And this is Rev 1, by the way. It's not the right version. Let me let me take you to the right version of it. They're on risk. Um, they're on version 2 right now. So let me see if I can find that one. Yeah, here it is right here. Revision 2, revision 2. NIST 837, revision 2. This is the best resource outside of their security policies that you can read. Once you understand this, and it's not that long of a document. I'm, it looks kind of imposing because it has how many pages? 163 pages. But a lot of this is um, appendices and stuff. The main body of, the, of, the, of this book, of this publication, is not that long. It's not that long. And then um, another one you want to glance at is more of a... It's more of a resource. You don't have to read it from cover to cover. 
is the NIST 853. So if you read, if you, you could just glance at that one to get an idea of the security controls. So the main documents you're going to have to know as an ISO is going to be the NIST 837, the NIST 853, the NIST 853A, which is how do you assess each one of the controls. Um, and then other ones that you might come up at some point, there's a couple of them. One would be the FIPS 199 and FIPS 200. Those are probably your main documents. But other than that, the most important thing is going to be their security policy. Their security documentation, their security policy, and their, their system security plan. Yeah, those are the main things you're going to have to read for resources for an ISO that are going to help you out tremendously. Uh, let me see here. Oh, for those of you who are joining me a little bit late, um, I have a free book out right now, free for a limited time. If you've been watching me for a while, you know I do this from time to time. I give out free stuff to promote, and really it's so that I can um, uh, shame you into giving me a review. <laughs> give me a review. I really appreciate it, and that's a great, a happy Veterans Day for me. Like, Give me a review on that book. Download the book for free right now, temporarily on on um, Kindle, and then give me a review, and that really helps me out a, a lot, quite a bit. So, let me see. Let me see other questions here. What do you recommend to help familiarize an entry level on an entry level person on integrating policy and procedures? What do I recommend to familiarize an entry level person? with policy and procedures. Um, entry level, your entry level person, one of the things you can do is, is read the security policy. I know I sound like a broken record, but the end all be all of an organization is going to be a security policy. So once you read the security, it's, it's painful to read. Most security policies are not fun. You know, it's not Harry Potter. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not Harry Potter. It's, uh, it's going to be, it's it's not it's difficult. It's just very dry, you know, but the thing is, once you understand what the organization is trying to do in the policy, you start to get an idea of what of what direction they're going and what they're so the you'll get the DNA of what they're trying to do. So to familiarize yourself, you happen to be a new person, maybe you're an IT professional, you've been working in some retail place or you've been working on an IT person on a help desk and you're trying to get an idea of how to get into policy and stuff, read their security policy. Read their security policy and some of their uh, security um, programs, if they have a program, policy, whatever. And if you get your, get your hands on their, on their system security plan, which is a system security plan, for those of you who don't know, is a breakdown of the features of a system. Like if they have a, a group of servers that uh, is an on-premises cloud server and they have the name of it is cloud 2.0 or whatever, right? And it's really all it is is a rack of 15 servers that are all clustered together or whatever. <clears throat> and the, the name is cloud 2.0. They'll have a document that breaks down all the security features. It'll say, okay, here's how many controls we're using. We've locked it down for single sign-on. We've uh, it's got the audit logs turned on, and we're monitoring whenever somebody fails the login. The logs are stored over here. It'll have a breakdown of all the security features and who to contact if there's an incident response. It's monitored by the security operations center. All this stuff, whatever that document is, you you want to read that if you have access to it. But as far as like resources to give you an idea of um, what an organization is supposed to do, NIST CSF, which we've been talking about on this, is a great resource to, to understand what an organization is supposed to do. Because the NIST CSF has, has um, a category, I believe it's protection category. Uh, the, it's in the protection function, and it's under the category of protection, where it's talking about policy and how 
an organization is supposed to have policies and procedures that that explains what's going on from all the security features of their organization. So that's actually one of the things that you can read. The NIST CSF breaks down all that stuff. So number one, look at their security policy and you'll start to get an idea of what your what the actual help desk is supposed to do, what the server team is supposed to do, what the network team. That's what the, the actual policy is breaking down. Here's what you guys do. Here's what you guys do. Here's why you're doing it. Here's our mission. Here's it puts everything together. And so once you start reading that, it starts to the picture starts to be, get clear of what people and you start to realize that. They written, they've said that they're supposed to do things that they're not doing. And that's when you know you started into the GRC path. When you start to realize, hey, you guys, you guys said you're supposed to have encryption on all data at rest, but I noticed that this information here is not is not encrypted. So what's going on with that? That's when you start to see stuff like that. Congratulations, you are now a GRC, you're starting a GRC path. So Brittany says, just passed my AWS cloud practitioner exam, working on my portfolio. What project should I go for? Oh, man, that's incredible. That's great, Brittany. One of the things I was thinking about doing, I was thinking about also doing my AWS cloud very seriously. I've been thinking about it for quite some time. <laughs> uh, but uh, the project I was thinking about doing was setting up a... Um, setting up a node for crypto because a lot of those are cloud based they're they're based off some of them are aws based excuse me so you could do a node that holds crypto like it doesn't have to be a lot like it could be like a node for and there's a couple of different cryptocurrencies that have a node uh this is like Regardless of how you think about crypto, I know this is kind of a controversial topic. I don't really talk about it on this channel much, but that's not the point of what I'm trying. To... <laughs> so my thinking on setting up a node for cryptocurrency would be that number one, I'd have some skin in the game because I'd have to put money. It I have something to protect on that node, right? So now I have to set up that um, that client on the I don't know what they call it a container. I don't know. I have to set up the container in AWS, right? Now I have to have all the technical skills to set all that up. Then I have to apply all the security features because I have something to protect. I might put $50, $100 on it, and, and I really have to protect this thing. And it's got to be a part of the rest of the of the blockchain. So that's a, I mean, that's that would be a great project to do. Um, what other projects? I'm not sure what other... What other projects you guys have any? I'm not cloud guy. So what what other projects would you guys recommend that Brittany does to build out her portfolio? Other than that, okay. Um, but that's great. Congratulations, Brittany, on that, by the way. I've been wanting to do that for a while. How was it, by the way? I'm really, really thinking about doing AWS because I'm really getting behind on cloud and people keep asking me about it. And I have to I have to like do this tap dance around. <laughs> <laughs> why i don't fully uh, i don't have all the terminology down i'm not articulate on cloud stuff yet unfortunately so um how was that aws cloud certification i'm really really thinking about taking it like how on a scale of one to ten ten being uh the cissp and one being uh, the network plus <laughs> certification uh or itil certification on a scale of one to ten, how hard was the AWS certification? I'm curious. And is it worth taking? Do you feel like you can set up a a cloud, an AWS server now? I'm really, really thinking about doing it. Okay, while you guys are thinking about that, while my cloud professionals are coming back to me on that, let me just go to the next subject. Hey, Bruce, any advice on putting my acoustic padding cleanly? What the, what the hell? I don't I have no idea what you're talking about, my man. I have no idea. You might be on the wrong live, man. <laughs> I don't know. You could probably tell me more about that. Um, 
Somebody said, I am planning to study cyber field. I am. What is I? You mean information assurance manager or do you mean um, identity and and authentication manager? I am. Or are you saying I'm? I am. OK, you're saying I am. I'm sorry. I am planning to study cyber field. Uh, what's the basic things I should learn first? OK, basic things you should learn first. Let me let me see if I can show you a good diagram for it. Uh, there's a common body of knowledge that you need to to learn. Uh, and the more you know this, the more you understand this, the better a cybersecurity person you'll be. I found that people who don't know this because I people in the field of GRC, some of them are not technical at all. And it's kind of it shows when we get in the meetings with some system engineers who really know their stuff that, you know, some people don't know what's going on. And that's not to say you can't do this job because it's, you know, there, this it's a very broad field. And so everybody is not, does everybody doesn't have to know, you know, have they, everybody doesn't have to be a rocket scientist for this. Uh, we don't have to have everybody, we don't need everyone to be technical. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but um, there is a common body of knowledge that if you know it, you're going to stand out. You're going to stand out. You're going to everywhere you go, you're going to be kind of a badass if you know it. Now, on the top of the food chain, it's probably going to be all the way up to software engineers, software engineers. Um, if you know how to script, especially. Um, a big one is uh, Python. If you know, if you know how to do, uh, damn it, what's that one? Python Power Tools on Microsoft. If you know scripting, you are you're gonna be a badass in this field. But there's some things that you're not everybody has to know scripting. I don't I don't know scripting. Okay, Python and Go. Somebody said, yeah. If you know those things, man, everywhere you go, you're a badass. Everywhere you go. But even those guys have to know what I'm about to show you. So everybody needs to have these skills right here at a bare ass minimum. You need to have these skin, these skills. And if you know this stuff, if you have an understanding, a solid understanding of these things right here, I'm on CompTIA A+. OK, now people, all my fellow content creators shit all over this certification. But I'm telling you, if you are new to IT, if you're new to cyber, this is a good certification. Now, if you've been doing help desk for a while, you don't need this certification. You can just get a Security Plus or do something else. Get an AWS cloud certification. But if you're absolutely brand new to this, but look at this. It's, tell, it's going into hardware, software, operating systems, troubleshooting, software troubleshooting, security, operating, operational procedures, virtual virtualization, cloud computing. It's giving you a a bird's eye view of some of the terminology you need to know, an understanding of what you need to know, how to this basic IT, basic IT. If you if you understand basic IT, it's a really, really good foundation for you to start with. Really, really. So that's where I would recommend that you start. Is to get a solid. Thanks for all the likes. I appreciate that. Is to get a solid understanding of basic IT. Basic, basic IT, if you're new to this. And the more you look, you don't even have to do CompTIA A+. I, I'm just referring you to that because it's a marketable certification. And it was the first thing that I used. And I'm I'm just telling you, yeah, I used it. And after I took the test, after I studied enough to pass the test, I was like, it was like a light bulb came on. People would be talking about IT stuff and I'd know what they were talking about. I'd be like, it's like another language because you've got all these acronyms and all this, all the components and all the, how they work together and all that stuff. And all cybersecurity is, is the protection of those components. So it's a great, great start. If you don't know anything, if you're just starting out, if you're just trying to get in this and at the end of it, if you take the two, you sit for the test, you pass it. That test is, is marketable. I mean, that certification is marketable. Um, I don't recommend it for somebody who's already done the help desk or if you're a super geek and you already put your own computers together. You know, it's going to waste your time. Go straight to a Security Plus or something like that. 
you know, go specialize in scripting or whatever, something else. You you need to start thinking about or about specialization. Uh, somebody said. Um, somebody said knowing Linux plus scripting will get you at least 100K. Yeah, man, that's oh, my Lord. Um, Docker, Linux plus scripting. Yeah, Linux uh, is also an essential skill. Like I would say basic knowing how to navigate uh, really sets you apart. Like you'll I'll give you an example, even even as a, a GRC person who I don't even do hands on stuff anymore, but just understanding the Linux operating system, different Linux operating systems, uh, understanding uh, how those packages are put together to upgrade uh, Linux versus a Windows system. If I have a readout, if somebody gives me um, logs, I'll know if it's from a Linux system or a Windows system. You know, and from an IT perspective, like a person who's been doing this for a while, it's just trivial. Like what I just said, they'll be like, laugh out loud. That's ridiculous. But a person who's brand new to this, if you gave them logs for a Windows system and logs for a Linux system, they're not going to know the difference. They're not going to, they're going to look, it's going to look like gibberish and they're not going to know the difference. Just knowing how to navigate inside of Linux and just having exposure to Linux is freaking huge. And then scripting, scripting really puts you ahead above, uh, above a lot of people. Like it's, it's um, <laughs> a one of one type thing. Like most organizations I go to have some kind of there's, there's always one or two dudes who know how to script, and those guys are kind of left alone. People just leave them alone. Like, hey, see if see if Brad can uh, put together a script to make that faster, and Brad will put together a damn script to make it faster. And people don't mess with Brad because Brad knows how to do scripts. You know, and they'll be like, hey, Brad, can you do a script for this tenable system over here? Hey, Brad, can you do a, a script for this system? Over here? Scripting is on it. It's on a different level. So if you know how to do scripting, man, it's for cybersecurity. Yeah, you're you're a step above many, many people. So, yeah, I would. But first of all, I mean, if we're talking about like you're trying to come in to get in this field right now, scripting is like that's that's up there somewhere. Like right now, you need to know the basics. Um, tell us one thing that you enjoyed, um, along your journey in cybersecurity. Hmm. One thing that I enjoyed, man, the thing I've enjoyed most is traveling. Um, freedom. The thing I've enjoyed most, um, one time, well, recently I just got back. I mean, you've probably seen some of my videos. I just got back from um, the Philippines. Um, it was incredible. Like I was, I was with family and friends, and and um, I was able to do that with cybersecurity. You know, with my job, I I wasn't able to take my laptop there. I'm I'm in a job where I can't do that. But my previous one, I could. So in previous jobs I had, I could literally take my work with me, and I'd be overseas. One time I took my whole family to Hawaii. I had the money to do it because cybersecurity pays well. And I was working from Hawaii doing cybersecurity stuff. Um, it was it was amazing. Um, that's been my favorite thing about it, the freedom that it's given me. Uh, as far as the technical piece, I've enjoyed geeking out. Like I've met some really brilliant people. That's been fun. You know, career wise, I'd say one of one of the highlights of my career one time I, I did something totally different. I got bored with doing risk management framework because I've been doing it for like 10 years. And I just I wanted to get more technical. And I was kind of getting that's one of the things about GRC. Like you get out of the technical space and then you start to lose your skills. And I and I like the technical stuff. You know, well, I used to, you know, I used to be way more into this. And uh, I, I just went out on a limb and start doing cybersecurity. Um, analysis and that was really fun that was fun it was challenging but i i really had i enjoyed it it was i did it for about a couple of years and um i learned like network forensics and like i was using all these different uh seam tools and all the stuff it was really fun that was probably one of the most fun times it was very challenging 
it was actually a very challenging time in my life. But as far as the technical piece, like I got everything I wanted to do. I was working with Linux stuff. I was putting systems together from scratch. I got exposure to everything I ever wanted to do. And it was a highlight of my my work, like stuff I wanted. I just really got to geek out. I got to work with really brilliant people who um, who I looked up to and and I learned their skills like they were teaching me things I I didn't know before. Hopefully one of these days I can have them on my show. I can actually have a, a dialogue with them. I could reach out to them and they're doing big things. One of these guys works in Google. <laughs> He's a dude, right? Not, one of those guys who I worked with when I was doing that is now working at Google uh, doing cybersecurity stuff. So one guy's a freaking uh, I think it's a CISO or a CIO or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> Man, those guys are like, whew. um, that's awesome that you went to the Philippines. Yeah, you know, it's it's a change of pace, you know, uh, from from I love the U.S. You know, I, I love I love the U.S. I love I love what uh, a lot of things about the U.S. But um, sometimes like leaving the country gives you a different perspective on on what to appreciate here, like going outside of your comfort zone really exposes what things we take for granted in the U.S. And there's a lot. But also it gives me a perspective on the human condition and helps me to realize not only how blessed I am, but how far I need to go. Because I meet people, uh, some cultures have things so much better than we have it. And uh, you don't really see that until you go to another place and you see the good, the bad, the ugly of our culture, of the U of, of American culture. There's great things about the U.S., but also there's things that we really lag behind. You know, one of them would be, in my opinion, healthcare. You know, we 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 are not doing too well with healthcare. <laughs> We're not doing too well. Um, it's broken here. It's really you don't realize that until you go to another country get hurt and go to a hospital and they get a medical uh, exam that's supposed to cost 10,000 and you got it for free. Um, that comes with a price. You know, I, I realize you know, that's a whole different conversation. And I ain't going to get into on this podcast, but just, you just realize when you go outside of the country that there's some things here that are broken, culturally broken, like completely effed up, uh, systemically broken. And, uh, and then there's also things that you realize that are great here, that are just like incredible here that you can't get anywhere else. And you realize it really shines. Like for one thing, entertainment. I don't know if you guys realize this, but I remember one time, maybe 10 years ago, I was with a real close friend of mine and um, co-worker. And we were in Germany. We we're in the middle of Germany, man. Nobody spoke English. And we were looking for capacitors or something. and um, and uh, I hear a beat in the background. Somebody's blasting. I got five on it. I, so if, for those of you who don't know, I got five on it is a hip hop song from the Bay Area that <laughs> that's about using drugs. <laughs> that's a really good song. I got five on it. Somebody in Germany was blasting that in the middle of Germany. Nobody spoke English and somebody's playing. I got five. I was blown away. I was like. I was like, what the hell? Like, this was, you got to understand, like, it's a cult classic now, but where I'm from, it was a local, it was it was only local. That song blew up locally. I had no idea. This was 10, 15 years ago. I had no idea it was that big in another country that didn't even speak English. The U.S., the, the culture here is everywhere. The music, the clothes, the shows, everybody knows that, that dumbass show Friends. Everybody knows those characters. Everybody knows that. Like, I'm, it blows my mind. Like, you'll be, I'll be in like the Middle East and they'll be watching, they'll be watching Friends on, on a screen. And I'll be like, they, it'll be in Arabic. <laughs> like, what the hell's going on? So it's, it's really amazing. Yeah, it's really amazing to see like some of the great things about the U.S. that it's really succeeded. And then some of the things that 
we we fail at and and being able to leave the country and um gives you a different perspective on what what things to appreciate about the US cuz i another thing that i really appreciate about being here is that we do have huge problems economically but you know and i'm not taking away it from any of the uh poverty we have here but you haven't really seen poverty until you've seen extreme poverty and when you go to certain countries they have extreme poverty i'm talking about little kids on the street with no clothes on in the rain you know i'm talking about people oh man i, I don't even want to really talk about it man it's really sad but yeah it's, it's very sad but extreme poverty is something we don't experience here man so that really gave me a perspective on how lucky I am to be born uh, in a place like this that's very wealthy. And it made me realize I need to do more. I need to get I need to be more wealthy so I can help more people, you know. And so that's kind of what my life has all been about. Like I want to be more stable so I can help more people so I can have more reach and outside of my family, like help other people in a real way that lifts all of us up. I think that if we if we can lift, if we can lift all of us up, we can pull more people up with us. You know what I mean? Like look at a thing like the con I guess it's controversial, but but that dude Mr. Beast, like he went to Kenya and then put like a hundred wells in. Like people are pissed off about that. But I'm like, dude, he literally is gonna a million people are about to have fresh water because of this guy is a wealthy dude who went over there, used his celebrity for good. I'm like, that's a great thing, man. The more wealthy you are, the more you'll be able to help other people all over the world, not just your family, not just your friends, not just in the U.S. Like you'll be able to go and help everybody, you know, and that's what me doing the books is about. That's what Combo Course is about. That's what makes me excited to do stuff like this live because people from all over the world are watching this and I get to interact with people from Kenya, from um, from uh, Ghana, from uh, UK, from all over the world. People are talking to me and I get to talk, you know, help everyone. And that's that's just really awesome. So thanks for that question. I really appreciate that. Happy Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day. Yep. Thank you for all of you guys who served. You guys know what's up. You guys know what's up. Any other questions? Any other topics to talk about? We talked about, for those of you who don't know, you're coming in late. I've got a free book out, free for a limited time. Link in description if you're following me on Facebook or, or YouTube. Uh, link in the in the profile pic. Um, You'll see it in the in the link in my profile. That'll take you directly to the book. That first book is free for a limited time. I might discount it for some time. That book is a two book bundle, it's 400 pages long, and it's talking about the NIST cybersecurity framework. That's the first thing we talked about. Broke it all down for you a little bit. And then also it's talking about how to apply the NIST security framework to your organization's cybersecurity program. So those are the two books. And they're free for a limited time. All I'm looking for from you guys is a is a review because the reviews help me with the Amazon um, algorithm. Amazon has its own algorithm. So the more um, reviews that you have, legit reviews of people going there and, and give you a review from them purchasing your book, the more Amazon will share it to other people and say, hey, you know, you, do you want to see this book? So it really helps out quite a bit. When you guys and thank you guys everybody who's already given me a review man thank you so much from the bottom of my heart thank you so much that really really helps me out helps me to become a legit author because some of my books are doing really good and that's because of you guys so i really appreciate everybody on youtube on facebook on freaking instagram on facebook that i hate on linkedin people on on freaking tiktok thank you everybody um for helping me out with that. Okay, let me see. Let me see if I missed any questions. I apologize if I missed any questions. Sometimes the all of the stuff is scrolling really fast, so I might miss it. 
let's see here. Um, 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 I'm looking through TikTok to see if I have any other questions. I need a better way to do this. I wish TikTok was integrated with my other stuff here. Um, tell us what you enjoyed along the way. Uh, let me see here. More questions and comments. Um, let me see here. Questions and comments. I'm just looking through all comments on TikTok right now. And um, oh, here's some more stuff. Okay, here's some more stuff. Um, let me put this on the screen here. Are you doing? Uh, are you doing resume reviews? So I used to do this thing uh, where I would when when I very when I first started where I'd review people's resumes live. I just get somebody's resume and just review it live. Um, I don't do that anymore. And then I started doing like a paid service for it, but I started getting too many resumes. It was wasn't worth it because <laughs> I use a paid service to do it. And then so I had to charge people and then I would use that paid service to help me to go through the resume. But no, I don't. I do it, but it's very expensive. It's the best thing you can do if you want your resume reviewed is to use um, ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a really good tool. So what you do is take your ATS style resume. If you don't know what an ATS style resume is, you can actually go to my site and download my resume for free. That's an ATS style resume, along with a bunch of other da free downloadables that I have. Other examples of how to word it using an action and impact statement, how it's supposed to be set out. You'll notice it's not very fancy. It's just stripped down. tells you all the basic uh, place things that you should have on your resume. You know, your name, how to contact you education how to put that on there it has a for a certain format a chronological arrangement of your work uh experience how to name each field all that ats style resume check it out download it anyway once you get that um take your resume and then load upload that resume you can just copy and paste it and put it right into linkedin um not linkedin copy and paste it and put it right into chat gpt and and at, just tell chat chat gpt Improve my resume. <laughs> Improve my cybersecurity IT professional resume. My I my cybersecurity professional resume. You know, you can also what you can also do with ChatGPT. Check this out. You can actually get the job description you want, copy it, paste it into ChatGPT, and ask ChatGPT make a resume that fits this work this description this job description and then copy paste the job description and then it'll make the resume that fits that job description then what you can do is use that as an example of what things that you need to have that they're looking for on your resume so you could take the one that chat gpt made and then say okay hmm, how can i make this or you can even say chat gpt here is a job description here is my resume make my resume match this particular job as much as possible and it'll do it so i would highly recommend you do that um, and then another thing you can do is something called uh resume worded is a pretty good service resume genius is another good service i've used both of those i prefer resume worded it's really good i use it for probably like a year um, really great service i might even use it again sometime those are the best resume sources. Um, somebody said, is there a slowdown in the market right now? Is there a slowdown in the market right now? Last year, I got way more interviews and responses. Um, negative vibes. <laughs> That's his name. Yes, there's a slowdown in the market for sure. For sure. Um, I'm also not getting as many. Normally, I'm getting 
man, I'm getting so many, a flood of jobs. And I've noticed it's gone down a little bit. So there is a slowdown in the in the total market, I'd say. I mean, just from what I've seen, that said, there's still jobs in uh, the industry in looking for cybersecurity, looking for IT professionals with certain skill sets. The ones that have really slowed down is FANG. FANG is Facebook, Apple, um, Amazon, uh, Netflix, and Google, and uh, there's another one in there, Te maybe Tesla, I don't know. But those guys are slowed down because those guys are based off of, their revenue is really based off stocks, and now stock market's kind of dipped. So they're laying people off and, and all kinds of stuff. But the rest of the industry, it's dipped. I'd say it's dipped a bit but uh, because the whole economy is dipped. But it's they're still looking for people, man. Like even the place I work, they're, they're looking. We need people like bad. So <laughs> they're constantly every week putting out, hey, we need this. We need that. We'll pay you money if you can bring people into our corporation like they need people bad, but they're needing specific skills. So that's the thing, right? Industry. When I say industry, I'm saying government industry. Like they're looking for IT and security professionals for the government. They're looking for IT and security professionals for the healthcare industry. They're looking for IT and security professionals for retail, uh, you name it. So these all of the industries are still looking for IT professionals. Probably the biggest ones will be healthcare, uh, financial sector, and government are probably the um, the ones that are still really looking for people. Okay, let me see here. Thanks for that question, uh, Negative Vibes. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I've seen a dip. Um, I paid for my CompTIA security last December do i have to take the test within a year um you paid for your security i'm not sure about that let me see i'm i'm not do you mean that you did they give you a time limit i thought i thought if you if you pay you can pay for it in advance before i thought if you pay for it you got to go right in and take the test do you mean like you had a boot camp or something I have to have more context. I'm not actually sure about it. I don't know if I can answer your question. I've been an ISSO, Information System Security Officer, for the last two months. Was a system admin for the last 10 years. Well, congratulations. How do you like it so far? How do you like it so far? How do you like being an ISO for the last two months? Is it more stressful? Is it more stressful to go from being a system it's amazing, man. Great, great. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot better. The main thing I like it better is I also went from being like super technical. I was like a network engineer and like a Unix admin. And I went from doing that to doing pure information system security officer work. And what I like about it is that it's more evergreen. Like for cybersecurity in the long term, uh, what we have to know is the policies. We have to know NIST 800. We have to know different security frameworks. And those change like every six, seven years. But system administration, like if you're a Windows system administrator, that shit changes like, it's constantly changing. Man, they change the certification name, the stuff you have to do in the certification. They change the actual Operating systems constantly changing from Windows 10 to Windows 11 to Windows whatever. And it's like I needed a break from super technical stuff. Exactly. It's just constantly like the it's like a, it feels like a grind that you're constantly have you forced to learn. That said, uh, Chris, keep your skills because your skills are going to come in very handy. Like keeping your skills, meaning like, I don't know, maybe maintain a server or uh, get on the back end of a system every now and then, but uh, I definitely maintain your ser your skills. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's like a huge break, especially when you get as you get older, like myself. 
it's just like, it's just not, it's not a fun toy anymore, right? When I first got into IT, it was like a fun, not that I don't like it anymore. I still like uh, technical stuff. I still geek out on new phones and, you know, sit through the Apple's freaking uh, conference or whatever and, and, and like the new technology of of AI or something is, is marvelous. It's amazing to see it. But after a while, it's you it, doing this as a job. It's the magic kind of rubs off, man. <laughs> I'm definitely keeping my certs renewed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a great idea. Somebody said I'm finishing up my AAS in cyber and computer technology and systems and already got a network plus and a, AZ900, which is a Azure Cloud Cert. Is that an Azure Cloud Certification? Congrats. That's great. That's a great direction to go up, go in. Great direction. You're, you're off to a great start. I would recommend going to the Security Plus. Yeah, don't stop with the network. I also had the Network Plus. Not as marketable. Um, so I would, I would go as far as the Security Plus. And uh, and then the Azure 900 is great to to know, man. Great to know because cloud is super hot right now. I mean, I myself am so behind on cloud stuff. You ever mentor people? I did um, about a year, about a year ago in 2022. I quit my job and I was mentoring people for like a few months. And uh, I just I found that I don't have the time to do it like I would like to do it. So I'm not doing it right now. I have a full time job. You know, I do this kind of stuff on the weekends and when I'm off work. Um, I like doing this stuff, but mentoring is kind of like a whole its own thing. I would like to maybe pick it up eventually if this all of this stuff takes off and I have a lot more free time then I would do that. Like that would be like my full time gig. But no, I don't right now. I'm not doing it. Uh, Big Brother says. Fang equals Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Saw it in the news and they are downsizing. Yes, they are. And yes, there is a slowdown in hiring these days compared to two years ago, at least. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I'm seeing it in my in my uh, in my email. I used to get this flood of different op job opportunities and now it's less. Yeah, they're still there. That said, they're, they're still there for Maybe it's because the industry I'm in hasn't been impacted as much because it's not it's not as based on the economy. Like mostly it's like government contract type stuff. Those are the guys who go after me. So that's the kind of opportunities I get. So those haven't those have slowed down, but they're still there, you know. But yeah, Fang is getting downsized, man. It's it's looking ugly because they're they're completely tied to the to the economy. Uh, Javier says uh, the MCSA, MCSE versus the MD100, 102. What is the difference between those two? Can somebody explain that? I'm not a Microsoft dude. I know these are Microsoft certifications. Um, at one point, I had an MCP when I was more a hands-on technical guy. But right now, I don't know the difference between an MCSE, MCSE versus a MD100-102. But I'd be happy if somebody could jump on here and explain it to all of us. You know, somebody who knows more than me about this. I'm sure there's a couple of you guys on here who knows exactly what the MD-100 and 102 is. You guys ever had one of these? These are pretty good. This is a courtesy of Navi who gave me a donation. I was able to buy me some liquid death. Thanks Navi, wherever you are, this is to you. And to all my vets. Cheers. Happy Veterans Day. Thanks for all you do, especially if you're in right now currently. 
if you're if you guys are thinking about younger people who are thinking about going into the military, um, I was in the military for some time, and what I'll tell you is, uh, if you do go in, go in uh, for more than one reason, um, because when you get called to duty, sometimes. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it's going to really test you, you know. So what I mean to say is when I went in, I went in for a couple reasons, right? I went in for to make my own life, to to get away from ex the extremes of my home life. It was, it was really bad. It was really rough. And I also wanted to travel the world and I also wanted to get a degree, so I had several reasons to go in. So when I had to get, I got called to war. Like we were at that time, I went to two different major conflicts when I was in. I was in for eight years between the years of 2000 and 1995 to, to 2003. So I'm really dating myself. But that's, I mean, as you know, several things happened, including 9-11 in that, in that time frame. And uh, I, I was sent to a couple of really harsh places. But the thing is, I knew why I was there. I had a purpose. I had multi-tiered purpose of being there. It wasn't just to get a degree. It wasn't just one thing. So, so I had a, because I had multi-tiered purpose, because I have all these things tied into it, I just stayed the course. I, I was able to stay in there even when times were really, really hard. Um, I was able to stay in there and uh, and get what I wanted out of out of it because the military is going to get what they want out of you. So you need to get what you need out of the military. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. So if you if I'm not saying don't go, but if you do go, have more than one reason, right? Because it was one for me personally, coming from where I'm coming from, it was the best choice I made for my life. One of the best choices I've ever made was going into the military because it changed my life. I mean, it, it changed my economic life. It changed my like when I got out, I was I was an expert in, in a couple different fields, um, including IT and cyber sec and security. And um, I, I got all of these different bonuses and stuff when I was in. I learned all these trades. It really helped me. I, I came out with two degrees, a few certifications. I mean, I was I was set. Right. And um, I was very not only marketable, but I was competitive when I got out. So it was a great move. But just if you do go in, just go in for more than one reason. That's what I would say. Happy Veterans Day. Um, let me see. Javier says, what branch? The Air Force. I was in the Air Force for it. And I know what you're going to say if you were in the Marines or the, the Army is that it's not the real military, the Air Force. But actually, I was in a couple combat zones, and I worked with the Army and the Marines quite a bit because I was I was a weapons specialist. So I actually trained with the Army and the Marines when I was in. That's what we did. And and actually, a lot of the bases I went to had Marines, and we were protecting the base together. So, um, And then I cross-trained in into computers. So... Javier said, uh, MCSE and MDA100 are the same. Wait, it's the same, but I'm thinking that I it went from MCSE to MDA100. I, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know. MCSE doesn't really exist anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they did change the name on that, didn't they? See, that's another thing about those cert, those vendor certs, man. They're constantly evolving. What's it called now for you guys? Any MCSEs on here? I mean, was it? What is it? Is it? It's not MCSE anymore. I can't remember what. Let me see. M M C M C S E M C S E M C S E certification. Oh, that's the new name of it, huh? MCSE. What is the Microsoft? Sir? Okay. That's the old name of it. What do they call it now? Man, these ads are freaking killing me. Um, 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 um. 
Let me see. I don't know the new name of it. New name. Marines is is difficult. Yeah, I would say so. I remember when I was thinking about going to the military, my buddy had just came back from uh, from the Marines. And um, I was about to go in the military. And he just came back. He was in the Marines and just came back from boot camp. Now, he'd been in for a while. He'd been in for like three, four years. And um, I was talking to him, and he was like, and I said, hey, man, I'm thinking about going to the military. He said, what branch? I said, Marines. He said, man, he was a Marine. And he said, don't, don't, don't do, don't become a Marine. man." He said, don't do Army and don't become a Marine. I said, why? He said, so the Air Force has the best bases. This is what he told me. This was years ago. <laughs> says the Air Force has the best, the best bases and the best looking women. <laughs> Um, and then he said, uh, the Marines and the, and the army does not, it's not treated as good as the air force and having been to an air force base versus a Marine base, he said, is a big difference. And he said he recommended the air force or the Navy. And so I took his advice. I went to, we went to the air force and, uh, that was a great, very good decision. I would like, Oh, that dude a lot because man, that was he was right. Because every time I was stationed with the Marines, I'd be stationed with Marines or Army. I'd be on Army base, whatever. Man, some of those bases were literally dangerous to live on. <laughs> some, I mean, some of it's just now hitting the news, but some of some of those bases are literally were literally dangerous. Like you can, there was one base we went to that has had asbestos on it in it. Like it was, <laughs> we didn't even know what rooms had asbestos in it. Like that's how bad it was. And we was, it was an army, it was an army base. And uh, man, I'm just like, damn, they, he was right. <laughs> Cause no, there's no air force base that was like that. So I said, sounds about, it sounds about right. They were, and they were treated bad too. Like, especially the army. Like I, most of my exposures to the army, and man, the army's leadership did not treat them right, man. I mean, maybe it's changed now, but when I was in, man, they did not, they didn't, they wouldn't fight for the soldiers, and I never understood that. And I think it's because one soldier told me he says an, an airman is not a soldier, and he said, and we we're like, why? Why are you saying that? You know, we felt disrespected as airmen because we were going through the same training as them. We were army, army, our. Army drill instructors were training. This was way back, so we were training with the army directly. We had we had army vets, we had army um, drill instructors, and um, they were training us on combat on um, air base ground defense is what it was called. And these guys were old, like they had been to like Panama Canal or some shit. I don't know something war from the 80s you know i think it was the first iraq war they were in and uh they were telling us armed and, and a soldier is not an, an airman is not a soldier and we we're like why why would you say that and uh he said because if you tell a soldier to do something they're gonna do it period but an airman's always like why why do we have to do that why can't we do this why <laughs> i think he's right about that airman asked too many damn questions That's the DOD, correct? Yes. Azure has taken over. Really? Really? Man, you're educating me. Because I'm looking for MCSE and all I'm seeing is Azure stuff. Hmm. Man, I really got to get in the cloud, man. For real. Goodbye, Microsoft certifications. I'm kind of just now looking into it. Let me see here. 
Are you ever getting old? Are you ever too old to get into IT? No, absolutely not. Um, are you too old to get into IT? Uh, no, I don't. I don't believe so. There was this mechanic. Let me see if I want to get this guy's name because this is a really good story. I want to share with you guys. There's a mechanic, mechanic who became a doctor. I don't know if you guys heard this story. A medical doctor. And um, yeah, his name is Carl Alambi. Check this out. This is a crazy story. And um, he's, he's now a doctor in Cleveland, Ohio. And he started his medical profession as a mechanic. He was a professional mechanic. And uh, became, started his medical practice at age 41. He's 41 when he started working towards his medical degree. Yeah, here's, here's right here, Carl. He's now uh, an MD. <laughs> you know how hard it is to become a doctor and how many years it takes? He started at 40. He was already a full-blown mechanic and just became a doctor at 51 years old. So, no, it's not. It's absolutely not too late. Um, whatever you want to do, man, do it. Go for it. It's not too late. Not at all. Not at all. Um, what I will say is, um, it, what you, what will happen if you come in as an older person is that, especially if you're doing technical stuff, is that you will have to be mentored by people younger than you. So you have to swallow your pride and, and learn from people who are younger, you know, cause they, some of these, especially millennials and Gen Z, these guys were born into this. Like they, it just comes to what I've found, even me, I started in my twenties, but People started younger than me. Like there were people already. I was in my late 20s when I went into cybersecurity, into IT. And I was getting trained by people who were already younger than me. And they already were into this. And now sometimes even my kids are telling me how to do stuff because technology is constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly. So it's constantly staying things to learn. So you will, if you come in late like if you're 40 35 you know 50 years old when you come in this field learning it stuff it's fun like especially if you're like really into it and you're all geeking out and stuff man people if you love to learn then man by all means do this do it because they'll be it's infectious when you are excited about this field people it rubs off on people so if that's you and you are not too proud to learn from somebody younger than you because you will have mentors who are younger. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, some brilliant younger people out there. We should all learn. I'm, I'm learning uh, super late in the game business stuff from people way younger than me who are millionaires. And uh, I'm like, I'm inspired, you know, by them, actually. They're, I'm inspired by their energy. I'm inspired by their new, their whole new way of thinking. And if that's you, then no, it's not, it's not too old. Um, Big Brother says, um, I wouldn't say too old, but it gets harder the older you get to A, get an entry level job and B, keep up with the new technology. And depends on how old you are. Are we talking 40s? If you're talking 40-ish, still okay. 50s, it might be uh it it's you could do it but um yeah i would i would agree with a lot of what big brother said there which is that it's going to be it's going to be harder you know like it might be like maybe it depends on your mindset right it really depends on you like cuz everybody's different i mean my man carl he's doing something way harder than you know the medical profession a doctor is is much harder than most of the things you're going to do in it much harder uh, it takes eight years to learn it. You've got to be, you've got to be expert level on several different 
uh, parts of the medical field. Like it's crazy. It's crazy how much learning. And then they've, you know, it's, it's got thousand years worth of information that's being stuffed in your brain, whether IT has been around, cyber has been around for what, 100 years, maybe almost 100 years. I don't know. We have less information, but granted, it's a lot of information in a shorter amount of time. Uh, but it's this dude, Carl, he was a mechanic, started at age 40 and is now a medical doctor. I mean, you can do it. Like if you if you really want to do it, man, you can you could totally do this. But yes, Big Brother's right. It's is it ain't gonna be easy, you know? Like you especially if you're if you're hard headed, <laughs> don't be stubborn if you're open. I think if you're open minded, you just love to learn. If you're sharp, you remain sharp, uh, you can pick it up. That won't be a problem. But I'd say really. You got to put your ego aside and learn from younger people than you. Um, you can do it. 40s, 50s. You can, you can totally do this if you want. I will say this. There might be another alternative where your skills will be better suited. I would say if you're a project manager and you want to have some IT skills, that would probably be a better one because you're going to be paid as much. And project management or program managers are actually going to use your leadership skills because you probably already have leadership skills. So you would probably be better suited for a management type to go in that direction is what I would say. It, Cause you could use the skills you already have. Like if Carl went to our field and I would say, Carl, man, yeah, you know, cybersecurity is cool, but you might want to look into a project, a pro program manager, because you already have been a manager at your mechanic shop. You've been doing that for 10 years and you know how to lead people. You know how to supervise. You know, maybe you've hired people, you've fired people, you've managed people. Those kind of people skills are kind of be better suited for a pro program manager or a project manager or something like that than to cybersecurity. I'm not saying don't learn cybersecurity. Get your security plus. Get your If you want to learn that stuff, go ahead. By all means, go ahead and do it. But there might be something that pays more and is in line with skills you already have already. So just something to think about, you know. Javier says, um, if he's starting on help desk, um, he better start now. It's moving so fast that it will have your hair standing up. I've been there. <laughs> um, yeah, IT moves really fast. So there's so much happening right now. So much happening in cloud and AI. It's those things are converging on on our skill on our field, and it's coming to a point where we have to learn it. Like us in the in this field, have to learn cloud, have to learn what's going on, have to pay attention on what's going on with IT. And I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but even um, quantum computing. I don't know if you've heard about this. I might do a whole video on it, but quantum computing is also encouraging and encroaching on cybersecurity as well because. <laughs> what's happening is quantum computers are being created and th these computers have the ability to crack certain encryption that we already have that's out there right now. So, <laughs> so even that is another thing that I've had to pick up and like learn up on like what's going on with quantum computing. It's here already. Damn. You know, and they're already getting the parts of the government are getting prepared for the, in the uh, in the financial space, are all starting to get ready to change their encryption to something that can't be cracked as easy with quantum computing. So there's all of these different technologies that are all starting to happen, like right now in real time. Project manager would be a better would be better if you're older. Uh, I have to agree because. You're going to be able to use your skills and get paid crazy. You could literally even put the stuff that you did in the past, especially if you are a manager or a supervisor, that you could have on your resume and then use that to build up your a case to be a project or program manager in an IT program or in a cybersecurity program and get direct exposure to cybersecurity as well. And continue to build. If you if you happen to be like a tinkerer, you just love to get your hands on uh, technology and be on top of what's going on, especially in an organization. Man, if you're a program manager, you're managing people to to do these different projects or whatever. 
you're going to get exposure to what's going on and how these organizations are using cloud, using AI, using all the stuff to do business essential functions. So you'll be able to continue to learn if you want to, you know, in the background. And if you you can just get as, as technical as you want. I'm federal and doing risk management framework makes me want to go to government track contracting, shaking my head. I'm federal. Oh, you're fe are you a, are you a, a GS? Are you a GS? I'm federal and doing risk management framework makes me want to go to contracting, government contracting, shaking my head. Yeah, I need to know, man. Resilient. I need to know this answer. Yes, GS. Hmm. I get a question a lot. Resilient. Maybe, I want to get your two cents on this. People ask me quite a bit since you happen to be a GS person. And for those of you who don't know, the difference is a GS person is a person who works directly for the federal government, meaning their paycheck comes directly from D D O E or Department of Energy or Department of State or D the DOD. They're paid. They're not in the military, but they are directly employed by the federal government. And that's different from a contractor like myself, who I work for the government, but I work for a company that has a contract with the government. So we're treated very differently. Right. My paycheck comes from the company that I work for, but they have their their money comes from the government. So there's a huge there's a huge difference. So a lot of times resilient would be my boss or my he would be my either my boss or my customer. So I would be serving. We would be doing a service that helps him out, uh, whatever organization he works for. Um, so the question I get asked a lot is, what should I do? Should I work directly for the government as a GS person? Um, or should I be a contractor? And my answer is usually the same because I've done a bit of both. Um, I worked directly for the government when I was in active duty. I, I was never a GS person, but I worked directly with a lot of GS people, um, even now and, um, mostly been contractor. I would say the difference is this. GS people tend to get paid less, their check is less, but their but their benefits are way better. Contractors, we get paid more, our paycheck is more, but our benefits are not even close to what the GS people have. Now, you might be thinking, well, I want that paycheck. Okay. So... If you happen to be a younger dude who has no kids and not really, maybe you're married, but you just married with, you know, two years, whatever, you don't really have a family, you know, it's just you, single, whatever. Uh, yeah. Then contracting sounds really good because maybe you don't need dental as much. You don't need to worry about college stuff. You're done with that. You, you know, you don't need a lot of, uh, you don't need a lot of benefits. You don't need health care. It's kind of like, okay, you know, you're super healthy. You're 25, 26 years old. Like it's not that big of a deal. You don't have kids. You just want that check. But if you happen to have a family and you have to start thinking about retirement, you're older, you have kids that have to go to college, if you have teenagers or younger kids, they're always in and out of the hospital or going and getting their teeth fixed or their eyes checked or some some shit's always happening. So if you and you're trying to just settle down, you're not trying to do all this crazy shit. You just want to settle down, do one job and just some boring ass job behind a desk and make that money. And you just need those benefits for your kids and your wife and your retirement. Then GS is a it's it's more attractive, right? So that's what I would say. Like, it depends on your needs. A GS, they get paid less, but their their benefits are way better. And your your benefits resilient are way better than mine. Like you you have a if I'm not mistaken, you have a month of vacation a year, right? Is that still how it goes? You I can tell you this: your medical is way better than mine. 
Uh, and I got two kids who are in and out of the hot, you know, they're going to all kinds of stuff is happening. So I've constantly got to make sure my benefits are good. And I've got to really think whenever I go from one company to another, I've got to really think about what benefits they have because of that. And I'm retirement age. I got to also think about that. If I was a GS, a GS 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, I don't think I would have to think about all the stuff that I'm now I'm having to like figure out how I'm going to go to this company and what shares I'm going to get and my 401k and shit like that. You don't really have to worry about that because if you stay in as a GS for 20 years, you guys got a pretty good retirement. Um, the contracting does not have a good contract. They're, they're dependent 100% on 401ks, man. And it, I don't know. Like you can see the economy right now, how it's doing. So stocks aren't doing too well right now. So unless you started in your 20s doing 401ks, you know, you're kind of screwed on that. Depends on what you what you're trying to do, but uh it's not always the best to go contracting route. It's a lot more risky at any time. Hell, uh, just a few months ago, our contract was the for the company I work for was just up for rebid. Like we were they were competing, and that's every year. I don't know, every year. Or two, I think it's a three-year contract. So I think we have three years. Uh, so in the next three years, they're going to go up for rebid and, and recompete or whatever for this contract. There, I don't remember how long. But the last place I was at when I was in working for the government, when I was with NASA, that was like every man. They were that was like every year they were getting. Re it was crazy, man. It was so volatile. Uh, and have you okay? So a couple people are putting their two cents in. Javier said, "I've worked for federal and state uh, contractor for years. Contractors, government governance, uh, contractors, government can be less difficult, but better pay. Okay, working for the government, their policy is in stone, is set in stone with good benefits." Right. Yep. Happy. I have to agree with you there. That's what I've seen, too. Um, as far as easier, I don't know. It kind of depends. Um, I would say. It really depends on what. What your job is, whether or not it's more difficult, because it when I was working with the Air Force, I was a contractor and I worked really, really closely for with GS. It's like GS would be like over here. And then they even offered me a GS position. But I, I had to take like a $10,000 a year pay cut. And I said, no. <laughs> but now it's looking a lot more attractive. That was like 15 years ago. I'd probably be retired by now if I had taken it. And they offered me. I mean, they offer me a ton of stuff, man. Their benefits are off the. And looking back, maybe I should have taken it because literally I'll be retired by now. But I didn't. I had a business and the business was going pretty good. I had, you know, it's so volatile out here. Outside the government is super volatile. Uh, but anyway, so easier. Um, is it easier? I, we were doing the same job. I was I was a contractor, but I was doing the exact same job as the GSs. We were doing the same job. The only difference was that I would be. I was kind of subordinate to them because. I was supplementing their work. They we were doing the same thing, but then they had so much overage of work. They would like, I would be doing a lot of the other work. So I would say their job was easier to be honest, because they would just be managing us and they could just, anything that happened that was wrong, they could just blame it on us. <laughs> like, this is blaming on us. So I would say our job was a little harder at that time. It depends on what job, what job you had. Um, and then Resilient said, um, I'm med retired from the military and yes, the benefits are great. Excuse me. And including the one month vacation, still have a one month vacation. Awesome. But I have, but I have a decent package, but the risk, uh, the risk with contracting is the issue. Um, thanks brother. Yeah. The risk of contracting, that's probably the biggest thing, especially with a family, man. Um, I've dealt with it because I've 
I position my skill set in such a way that I have so many opportunities that even if I lose my current job, I could pick up a job pretty fast. A job that I want and a job that pays well because of my skill set. I just know my market very, very well. Uh, so that said, there's a risk. Like at any time, the contractors could be like, I'm, I'm having an issue right now with one of my um, government counterparts who doesn't is not happy with my work. They could just be like, they could just push a button and eject me. You know, like just go to my boss's boss's boss and be like, this guy sucks. I don't like his work. I told him 15 billion times to do X, Y, and Z, and then get me fired. You know, and then I'm out. <laughs> you know, what I, mean? I mean, I don't think they would do that. You know, there's a lot more politics and stuff going on, which I'm not getting into, but they have a lot of power, you know, so that is kind of crazy. The the government that said government people don't have the they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Like me, I have to worry about, OK, is my work good enough for them to continue my contract? Uh, is our overall contract good or are we going to get a recompete? What happens if we get laid off because the economy is not doing good and they want to cut back on? They're you know, whatever. Right. I, that stuff is a real concern. So it's risky, man. But I am getting paid more like I'm getting paid more than if I was a GS. I think I'm getting paid as much or more than like a GS 12 or GS 13 or something. So I don't know if they call it GS anymore. Uh, let me see. Javier says I've worked for NASA, FEMA, MDA, um, the project. Managers screws around too much with the contracts. So, so much change. Yeah. One of the, one of the problems that brings up a really good point about scope creep. So a lot of times what will happen is they'll come up with a contract and then say, okay, yay, verily the contractor trying to contractor B shall do X, Y, and Z. And then we start doing X, Y, and Z. And then they're like, okay, you X, Y, and Z is, is not good enough. We need a, B and C too. And we're like, yo, that wasn't a part of the contract. Why Why are we adding A? They just kind of slip in A and B in there. It's like, why are we doing A and B? And the contractor's like, yo, okay, look, we don't want to We just got a $100 million contract. We don't want to F this up. They want this extra stuff. Let's just do it, okay? And then scope creep happens. Now we're doing extra work for we said we were going to do X, Y, and Z. Now we're doing A and B. And it's up to the, the, the company to push back and say, look, we, you guys said we're supposed to do this. And I was in a, I was in a place where it was really volatile, where they, they were fighting. Like the, the company I worked for wasn't allowing anymore. They had done so much extra stuff that we were doing all this extra work. And they were like, look, listen, we're not doing no more extra work. Like this is what we're supposed to do. And the government was like, you're not doing what? You're not, what did you say? And so they have every week they were having these knockdown drag out arguments about what we were supposed to do, and what what we weren't fulfilling. And it was it was ugly, man. It was ugly. So, yeah, a lot of times they'll try to fulfill that anything that they can to uh, to to get that contract going. And it makes more work. Big Brother says one question. I think Q&A testing can also be a good start less technical depending on the role and the company. If you have good communication skills plus some developer skills, uh, dev uh, advocates or technical evangelists. So though, oh, I, I hadn't thought about that. QA and testing is a good start for, hmm, I never, I, I've not done that side of the house. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't know about that. But if anybody else can chime in about QA and testing being a good, I think I, I used to work with some guys who did something like what you're talking about. And they they were like our system engineers. And what they did was validate that the stuff worked. Like we would put in all the security features. Um, the technical team would put everything together. The security team would come in, put all the security features on the system. And then we'd have this Q&A. I believe they were Q&A. We call them verification and validation. They would come in and they would make sure that system worked as uh as required and that's all they would do they, they would, might turn the system on make sure it boots up properly make sure that the user can sit in there and, and use it as 
and is performing its duties properly on time. They would just have like this checklist and say, okay, requirement A, we're supposed to detect this anomaly within five minutes. Okay, that's good. We're supposed to have this sound pop when this thing happens. Okay, they would have this checklist. I think that's what you mean. And they were not too technical, actually. They weren't in the weeds on any kind of operating systems. They weren't they weren't checking our scripts. They weren't, you know, looking at they were just making sure the system worked as as it was supposed to work. So, Big Brother, you might have something there. Let me see. I got some other people in the conversation here. That's the fastest way for the scope creep to happen. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Contract jobs uh, always run out. Always guaranteed. You're not guaranteed. Plus a ton of red tape. Altogether, take the money and continue to educate yourself. They, they will probably pay for it. Also gain from the 401k. Yeah, contract jobs. Um, it's not forever. You know, that's the one thing I would say resilient is that Javier's right. It, they always have an expiration date. And we as contractors always have to say, have to plan for that. And that's that's one thing I've been doing is like I'm always, always planning ahead. Like, what do I this job I see as a stepping stone? I'm not trying to stay here forever. The contract's not designed to stay to stay forever you know it's, it's got if we're lucky 10 years if we're lucky 10 years and um god willing i'm gonna be a lot around a lot longer than that so i gotta think about my kid my my family you know so i'm always thinking about okay what can i do to continue to get income and that's what's inspired me to do like all these side hustles and business ventures and writing books and and doing real estate and all this other stuff because i need income that survives this contractor business, you know, and um, I've already, I've already, the ship has sailed for me. You know, I can't, I'm not going to go back to the government. Um, I'm not going to be a GS. I don't think, I mean, unless some magical freaking opportunity comes uh, and it pays a really good amount and maybe, I don't know, but um, no, I don't, I think it's, um, that ship has sailed for me. So I'm going to have to continue this route of, of doing business. In real estate. Uh, let me see. You're lucky if it's 10 years. Yeah, man, I, I agree with that. Mike says, um, what's your opinion on working for JSOC at Fort Bragg doing risk management framework? Um, I never worked there before. I don't know. But usually, uh, usually Joint Security Operations Center. So normally, whenever I've worked for an operating center for the Department of Defense, they do a lot of incident hand. They have like a different teams. They'll have like an incident handling team. They'll have a forensics team. They'll have a, a like a an op a, a cybersecurity analyst team who's like monitoring all the traffic, and then they'll have a risk management team who's making sure all the policy everybody's. Uh, doing all the policies i would say it's really great exposure to how an organization is supposed to run having worked in outside the federal government having worked with different industries such as healthcare and banking industry i can tell you this the department of defense is no joke um the department of defense is no joke uh, i think that they've been aggressively attacked for so long that they have to have their shit together all the time. Every now and then they slip up and they get attacked or they have a leak or whatever. And it's normally like Department of Veteran Affairs or like it's like it's all these offshoots of the Department of Defense. It's not the actual it's not usually the DOD, but it does. I mean, not to say that they don't they not they don't slip up, but the stuff that they have that's, that they want protected is freaking protected, man. And so the, the, probably their biggest threat is insider threats, to be honest with you. People are already on the inside leaking information all over. Uh, it is a great place to start because it gives you a really good foundation of what's supposed to happen. So after the DOD, if you are working in any part of a DOD SOC, you're going to know how a SOC is supposed to be run, what they're supposed to be doing right. 
um, in order to make a because there you got to remember even if there's stuff's effed up inside of there like you're gonna see stuff that's effed up like you're gonna see stuff people doing two jobs you're gonna see systems that are not you know whatever like has vulnerabilities but what I mean is you got to remember they are dealing with hundreds of thousands of assets and they have probably some of the most they're protecting some of the most important information with the highest stakes they're getting attacked by other governments right they're on a whole different ball game bro like it's this is not healthcare industry like you are it doesn't get much higher the stakes don't get much higher than a dod sock you're protecting sometimes literally the systems are protecting people's lives Literally, if that information is leaked, somebody is going to die. Um, the stakes don't get much higher than a Department of Defense SOC. So if you have any exposure to a, a DOD, you already have an advantage over most people who are just exposed to healthcare or just exposed to, I don't know, banking industry. You already have. And what I've noticed is everywhere I go, like whether I'm where I've worked in the private sector, private having nothing to do with the department, with any kind of organization. Private sector, um, the DOD people, we <laughs> there's always DOD people there. There's always ex-military. There's always veterans. There's always people who work who are contractors or GSs in the DOD. And those guys are always like, hmm, why don't they have a policy here? In the DOD, and they're always like, in the DOD, this is what we did. And the DOD, this I find myself doing the same thing. And the DOD. This is what we did. We did this and that. And the DOD, here's how we handled vulnerability management. You know, even now, like if you have any exposure, whether you're a contractor, a GS, if you're in the military, if you DOD, they, you're playing at the highest stakes in one of the most volatile networks in the world for arguably the most powerful military that has ever existed on planet Earth. I mean, you got to put it in perspective so yeah if you have any exposure to it it's it's great um because they have to do things at a at a level that most organizations don't need to so um and then resilience said wait javier said dod isn't a playground but you can easily get the six figures if you're if you're dedicated, cyber is uh, is their biggest. Yeah, no, for sure. I know you got to. I know you got some videos on Stig Viewer. Is that in your course, or can you drop a link where um, you have a your YouTube page got some someone who could benefit from it? I don't really have the best stuff on Stig Viewer. I have like one video on it where I did a walkthrough. I don't, it's not in my course. I stay high level with for risk management framework, ISOs, information system security officers, and some of the stuff that we have to do on a daily basis. I'm talking about that kind of stuff and getting people familiar with risk management uh, with, with NIST 837 um, and NIST 853. I'm not getting into the weeds on implementation as much. I've, now I've thought about doing a more robust, um, course about that and i've gotten some people asking me to do more hands-on type stuff that's a whole different course i don't think that they're they don't understand how much work would go into that and some of those three thousand dollar courses do go into that that's going to take a lot of my time to do it not to say i won't do it not to say it's impossible i'm just not i'm not trying to make excuses but no I, it's not in my course i do have a video about it i can point you to really good sources better videos than mine on YouTube um, that talk about the Stig Viewer and, and have give you a walkthrough. Actually, the site, I believe they have an official video that walks you through it. Once you download the Stig Viewer from disa.mil, cyber.mil, whatever the hell they call it these days, they have a video that walks you through and they have like an instruction on how to do it and everything. But and let me see if I can find it and then I'll maybe I can link it here. Uh, let me see. You speak. So uh, you're so speaking the truth. <laughs> yeah, man. 
I'm walking the walk. All right, let me see what's going on on TikTok real quick. Um, somebody said, was were they pen testers? I, he might be talking about when I was talking about the DOD stuff. Um, yeah, there's like red, they call it red teaming in the, in the DOD. They have a red team. You have, um, GRC people as information system security officers on multiple levels. Uh, you have red teamers on different levels. You have red teamers. Normally what they'll have is pen testers come from outside. They'll have an outside organization come and do pen tests. So they, they will have red team, but normally it's like a cybersecurity person who is doing a red team task rather than like a whole unit that that's all they do. I mean, I, I'm, I've heard, I know that they have those, but usually whenever we'd have pen testers, they'd be an outside organization, either private sector or another government that government uh, agency that would come in and do the pen test. I don't know if that's answering your question, but. Um, what's the what's the salary these days for help desk IT? Depends on what you're doing and de it depends on a couple things. Depends on what you're doing and the job role, the role that you have. And it depends on where you're at. That's going to determine how much money that you get. But on average, I believe the median price uh salary for a help desk person with about a year of experience is about 50 i think but let me i don't i don't want to lie to you let me just google it real quick i'm gonna type in help desk i'm just on google type in the help desk um help desk salary it's gonna break it down by let me show you guys my screen here Yeah, so it's saying 44,000 44,000 to 50 to 54,000 is what they're saying here. And and it really this is a really deceptive because it really depends on where what part of the country you're in because some are going to pay more or less based off of where you're at like you're going to pay get paid more typically in like the the east coast pays a little bit more overall but then their cost of living is super high um and it also depends on how many years of experience that's another big one yeah years of experience really really matters man and and it also depends on like i said your role because if you're a manager managers are going to get paid more in that in that role and uh javier confirmed he said it depends he says if you're a government contractor it can be 40 to 70 amen and he said it depends yes it really really depends depends on um what the role is who you're working for where what part of the u.s you're working how many years of experience you have um combined with your degree if you have a degree and uh certs and all that kind of stuff depends but i would say the average is around 50 if you have one a deep let me put it to you this way it, in colorado if you work for the government and you're a help desk person it's going to be around 50 to 55 in colorado help desk one year of experience with a security plus probably about 55 50 55 so that's about as medium as i can as i could get and that re, and that still depends you know so all right guys i've been talking for over two hours i think i'm gonna end this but thank you guys so much happy veterans day thank you everybody who got my free book and gave me a review thank you in advance for all of that i really really appreciate it you really helped out a veteran if you downloaded the book and number two if you gave me a review i really really it's really going to help me out quite a bit. It helps out my whole family. Um, so I really appreciate you. That's it for this one. Um, I'm going to try to be more consistent about doing these once a week. i just been traveling and stuff. So that's why I haven't been. I'm, I missed a couple of these. Thanks, Resilient, for that 19 bucks, man. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the great conversation. I have some really, 
awesome people here who who's who's sharing their experience. And that's what I love the most about this community. If you guys didn't know, I have a Discord if you guys want to continue to talk. I drop jobs on there from time to time. Um, if you happen to be on my newsletter, if you want to be on it, just go to combocourses.com and sign up for the newsletter. I send out jobs. It's not a normal newsletter because I hate when people spam me with a bunch of stuff they want me to buy, which I don't mind every every now and then. But, you know, for me personally, when I'm on a newsletter, I want I'm trying to get something as you know, I, I want to provide value to me to you so you don't unsubscribe from me. So if you're on my newsletter, I give out I do job opportunities, stuff that's sent to me. I send it to you guys. Um, just ones that I think are good. Uh, I'll send out free books, free audio books, uh, free downloadables that you'll get it first before I'm even doing these videos. Sometimes I'll do a special video just for my just for my core audience, which is my my mailing list. So um, just if you want to follow me, like even if you don't want this book necessarily, don't want to do NIST, uh, NIST 800, don't necessarily want to do NIST cybersecurity framework, you know, that's not you. I've got other stuff that comes out um, and I plan on partnering with other people at some point. And Resilience said, thanks. Thanks for everything. You helped me a lot in this career, man. Thank you so much for participating. I appreciate everybody. And so that's it for this one, guys. Check out that free book. And I'll see you guys on the next one.